Mr. Levine received his degree from Yale Law School and has been a proponent of free speech and civil rights from early in his legal career. In 1964, he joined Freedom Summer in Mississippi and Alabama to represent activists involved in the civil rights movement. This work transformed Allen's life and shifted the trajectory of his career. In returning to New York, he joined the law staff of the Civil Liberties Union. Rather than returning to what he described as his cushy Wall Street legal firm. Mr. Levine has used his skills as a litigator to fight for justice for individuals and communities arguing civil rights cases before state, federal, and even the Supreme Court. He took on cases like the Island Trees case where his defense resulted in the library being forced to remove their ban of books such as Soul on Ice and Stories of Langston Hughes. As a writer and legal scholar, he co-authored a book titled The Rights of Students, as well as and wrote a number of articles and presentations on topics including civil rights, indigenous rights, and most recently against Islamophobia and on behalf of advocates for justice in Palestine. He was recently named a champion of justice by the New York Lawyers Guild and has been revered as a civil rights activist. I think he's a great example of solidarity in the struggle for justice for the long haul. Allen has taught constitutional law at New York City Law Schools and currently serves on the faculty of the Brooklyn Law School and is special counsel to Latino justice. Latino justice works to create an equitable society using the power of law together with advocacy and education to advance the success of Latinx people in schoolwork and community. The title of his talk today um, is Campus Protests and the Fight Against White Supremacy, How the Right Turned a Nationwide Movement Against Racism into a Debate About the First Amendment. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Alan Levine. Thank you so much, Dean Saliba. For the past three years, more than 80 campuses around the country, private colleges and public universities, ranging from here in the Pacific Northwest to Texas to New England, have been the scene of student protests mostly led by students of color. The protests have sometimes been precipitated by ugly acts of racial bigotry, other times by the accumulated experience of racism that make campus life for students of color a constant challenge. Whatever the immediate provocation, the origins of the student protests are to be found in most colleges' long histories of institutionalized white male supremacy racial and religious quotas in admissions, exclusion of women, race and gender discrimination in hiring, all white and all male social clubs, buildings named after slaveholders, traditions and customs rooted in racial and gender stereotypes, casual acceptance of sexual assault, discriminatory allocation of resources, and much, much more. Student protesters at most of the colleges have promulgated a series of demands seeking to undo their, those schools' legacy of white supremacy. For those who are interested, the students' demands can be found at thedemands.org. The demands are far-reaching. Increased recruitment to faculty and students of color, cultural competency, training for staff and faculty, and an overhaul of curricula to reflect the fact, in the words of the Princeton students, that learning about marginalized groups, their cultures and structures of privilege, is just as important as any science or quantitative reasoning course. Many colleges have recognized the legitimacy of the grievances and taken action. Buildings renamed racially insensitive administrators fired or forced to resign. Committees appointed to study curricula changes. It seemed that progress 
in addressing pervasive issues of racism and misogyny on college campuses was in progress. But then the conversations shifted. Yale had a controversy over Halloween costumes, and at Berkeley, Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter, and at Middlebury College in Vermont, Charles Murray, were all prevented from speaking by protesting students. Issues of racism and misogyny underlay all of those controversies, but those issues were ignored. Instead, students were being mocked for their hypersensitivity and called snowflakes and thugs. One national magazine ran a front page article about the coddling of the American mind. Students were said to be intolerant of dissenting views. One headline said it all. The battle against hate speech on college campuses gives rise to a generation that hates speech. That shift in the conversation did not just happen. In these times, it hardly needs saying that there are powerful political and economic forces functioning under the banner of the alt-right and the not-so-alt-right that are deeply invested in maintaining the privileges that come with white supremacy. The right-wing media, Fox News, National Review, Breitbart, and others have given the defenders of white privilege a highly amplified platform. Not surprisingly, what the media have not written about was the reasons for the students' demands. So the attacks have been on the students themselves, oversensitive, intolerant, and anti-intellectual. Attack the messenger, not the message, an old tactic. And in this case, not a surprising one. The right knows what's at stake in these controversies, and it's not free speech, a cause about which the right has been notably silent, except when it comes to limitations on corporate speech, which the right-wing group Citizens United successfully fought in the, in the Supreme Court. But when it comes to, for example, Colin Kaepernick, who has not had a job in the NFL this year because he kneeled during the national anthem to protest police killings of black men and women, the right-wing media has said nothing in his behalf. And on college campuses, the most persistent denial of free speech is in the continuing attacks on advocates of Palestinian human rights, attacks that have been extensively documented in a report entitled, The Palestine Exception to Free Speech. See if you find a word about that on Fox News. So it is not a principled concern for free speech that animates the rights in all this. It is, a re it is a free speech of Milo and Coulter and Murray, Charles Murray, who happen, just happen, to be relentless advocates of the rights agenda. While last spring's events on this campus involved speech by both students and their opponents, Fox News' extensive and decidedly anti-student coverage speaks volumes about whose, whose speech matters to that network. Before going further, let me be very clear. I take the right of free speech and the First Amendment, which protects it, very seriously. And nothing I say today should be interpreted otherwise. I have been a civil rights lawyer for more than 50 years, and many of my cases have involved defending the rights of speech and speakers whose words offend their readers and their listeners civil rights workers whose opposition to segregation offended their southern white audiences, students whose school library books were removed because their content offended school board members, a Muslim school principal who was fired because her definition of the word intifada offended the mayor, and Latino day laborers whose efforts to solicit employment on public streets offended town officials. In each case, I have argued the protection of the First Amendment. The right to say things that offend one official or another is a central principle of liberty. I will resist, both as a lawyer and as an activist, any attempt by the government to punish people because what they say is considered by some people to be offensive. I said by the government, and that is central. The Constitution protects our rights from violation only by the government. It is punishment of offensive speech by those who work for the government that is prohibited by the First Amendment. If city officials had shut down Milo, 
because they found his views offensive, they would have violated his First Amendment rights. The students' actions caused no constitutional violation. They were private individuals, not the government. Why is that important? Because in our daily lives, decisions are routinely made to curb speech in one way or another, and the First Amendment is not violated. The right of private individuals and institutions to take action that, effect that effectively interferes with someone's speech is taken for granted. It happens countless times every day. In fact, many would consider it a moral obligation to interfere with particularly hateful speech. They do so in recognition of the fact that while speech can be a vehicle for communicating ideas and searching for the truth, it also can be a weapon, a vehicle for inflicting injury, for dehumanizing and degrading those against whom it is directed. Thus, in recent years, I've been involved in the fight against Islamophobia and when posters that referred to Muslims as savages appeared in New York City's subway, activists pasted stickers on the posters that said, this is hate speech. Sure, the stickers somewhat impaired the free speech rights of the poster's creator, a rabid Islamophobe named Pamela Geller. At the same time, Muslims who rode the subways knew they had allies in their fight against the bigots. I have also argued in support of protests that sought to persuade a Long Island synagogue to withdraw a speaking invitation to Geller. The protesters argued that Geller's talk would contribute to the growing hostility towards Muslims on Long Island, perhaps leading to physical violence. The synagogue agreed and withdrew the invitation. In terms of free speech, the, the church's decision to deny her an opportunity to speak is no different from the student's actions in shutting down Milo. And the, and the rationale was exactly the same, the negative impact of their talks on other people's lives. So with these principles in mind, that there is often a justification for private individuals to interfere with speech in order to avoid harm to others, I want to return to college campuses and the charge that students and sometimes colleges acting on their behalf have interfered with the free exchange of ideas. I want to take a look, close look at two campus controversies, one at Yale University, one at Mid Middlebury College. First, Yale. Yale, like many other elite colleges, has a painful history of involvement with slavery and racism that continues to haunt the college. Two residential colleges, Calhoun and Morse, memorialized two of the country's most famous defenders of slavery. Student protest has finally forced Yale to rename Calhoun, Morse remains. Up until the 1980s, students at another residential college still referred to a portion of its courtyard as the slave quarter and advertised for a bring a slave party its liberal arts faculty has only 32 African Americans, less than 3% of the total. For those and for other reasons, life for Yale, Yale students of color remains a daily challenge. One woman of color charges that she was turned away recently from a campus party because she was told it was for white women. Another says, quote, I've been harassed in dining halls at fraternity houses and on New Haven streets by Yale fraternity members and male athletes. Their words, from charity case to ghetto black bitch, continue to echo in my head. And another speaks in an interview of routine racial slights, a friend's suggestion that she might be prettier if her hair were straight, questions about the role of affirmative action in her admission to Yale, a physics professor's suggestion that she might be more comfortable in an easier class. She calls her experience systemic racism. It is against this background that prior to Halloween in 2015, students received an email from Yale's Intercultural Affairs Committee asking students to avoid wearing, quote, culturally unaware and insensitive costumes. While acknowledging that Yale valued free expression, it also valued inclusivity. 
citing offensive costumes in the past that have been directed at racial, religious, and ethnic groups. The committee asked students to avoid wearing costumes, quote, that threaten our sense of community or disrespects, alienates or ridicules segments of our population based on race, nationality, religious belief, or gender expression. In considering a costume, the email suggested asking oneself, does it further misinformation or historical and, and cultural inaccuracies? Does the costume reduce cultural differences to jokes or stereotypes? It's worth noting that the Intercultural Affairs Committee included representatives of the college's religious and cultural centers, as well as the athletics department and the dean of students. All in all, it seems to me to be a rather sensitive document with its all too rare recognition expressed by key stakeholders of a college's obligation to make life tolerable for marginalized groups on campus. One Yale administrator, Erica Korsakis, saw it differently. Students, she wrote in an email, should be able to wear what they want even if it offends people. Quote, American universities were once a safe space not only for maturation, but also for a certain regressive or even transgressive experience. Increasingly, it seems, they have become places of censure and prohibition. To me, it seems a stretch to say that the wearing of culturally derisive costumes is the kind of transgressive behavior that contributes to the process of maturation, and Yale students of color would have none of it. A number of students confronted Krasakis' husband, another college administrator, and angrily protested his wife's ignorance of what life was like at Yale for students of color. As one student put it in a letter to the campus newspaper, to ask marginalized students to throw away their enjoyment of a holiday in order to expend emotional, mental, and physical energy to explain why something is offensive is offensive. To be a student of color on Yale's campus is to exist in a space that was not created for you. Yale's president who met with the pro protesters got the point. In a public statement he explained, the experiences they shared went beyond the incidents of the last few days. Their concern and cries for help made clear that some students find life on our campus profoundly difficult. He said to the students themselves, we have failed you. And there the story might have ended, an acknowledgement by college officials of a pattern of racist behavior and a pledge to fix it. But someone videotaped the campus confrontation with Krasakis' husband and the students. It showed lots of shouting, charges of racism, and counter charges of censorship. And it turns out the videographer was a man named Greg Lukianov, head of a group called FIRE, an acronym for the Foundation of Individual Rights in Education. Lukianov, who happened to be at Yale that day, made sure the video went viral. Fire. Fire was created a number of years ago to fight against restrictions on campus speech. Many of those were good fights on behalf of controversial speakers and in opposition to rules that unreasonably limited where and how students can protest. In the past number of years, however, it has devoted substantial attention to student protests against bigoted speech. Its general approach is seen in what it said about the Yale episode. It was, Fire said, quote, another unfortunate example of students who demand upsetting opinions be entirely eradicated from the university in the name of fostering safe spaces where students are protected from hurt feelings. To say that wearing a bigoted costume is no more than an upsetting opinion or that the purpose of the costume policy was to merely protect students from hurt feelings is a position that would be inconceivable in an article that had fairly described the litany of racist experiences that led to the policy. But the article was entirely devoid of a discussion of those experiences. I think that's no accident. FIRE has been funded lavishly, upwards of $6 million, by the country's most hard right funders, including the Koch brothers, 
Those funders in the right-wing media that articulate their white supremacist agenda are openly hostile to the issues raised by the Yale costume policy and by students protesting at other campuses. So Fire simply ignored those issues in its report. It turns out that the right found in Fire the perfect vehicle for discrediting the students. With its history of defending speech on campus, Fire has been well positioned to market a credible argument that Yale's costume policy or what the students did at Berkeley, for example, by keeping Milo Yiannopoulos from speaking was to violate the right of free speech. Let me talk about that argument. The starting point is to acknowledge the obvious, that the Yale Halloween email did impact the ability of some students to express their bigoted views. Having said that, Yale's costume policy was not adopted to restrict the expression of, quote, upsetting opinions, but because, as several of the college's departments understood and as the president eventually acknowledged, Yale had become a profoundly difficult place for students of color, a place, according to a student, in which she experienced systemic racism. It is in that context that the costume policy must be understood, a restriction on speech because of the harm it would cause, like the synagogue's withdrawal of the Geller invitation. Systemic racism, of course, inflicts, inflicts real harm. How could it be otherwise? In some small way, the costume policy mitigated that harm. It helped make Yale a place in which students of color could more effectively live and learn. If the price was that students no longer could express themselves by wearing bigoted costumes, it seems to me a small price. Let me turn now to Middlebury College, where the speech that students shut down was a scheduled talk by Charles Murray. In the eyes of most who know his work, he articulates a no less bigoted message than Yale's Halloween costumes or than Milo. But unlike Milo, Murray has some scholarly credentials and writes and speaks in an academic style. As a result, the students' actions were criticized not only by the right, but by the mainstream media and one prominent activist on the left. Others strongly disagreed with these critiques of the students, and so do I. Murray, as many of you know, is a sociologist and the co-author of The Bell Curve, written in 1994, which makes the case that social inequality is the result of genetic inferiority. The book is laden with statistics and psychological and sociological theory, but, not, but nonetheless, it has been almost uniformly discredited by serious scholars. The Southern Poverty Law Center says that Murray relies on racist, quote, racist pseudoscience and misleading statistics and calls him a, quote, white nationalist that is someone who, in their words, espouses white supremacist ideology. Murray was invited to speak at Middlebury in March of last year. When word of the invitation got out, 450 Middlebury alumni wrote an open letter to the college community. Though they acknowledged the importance to students at Middlebury of being ex exposed to diverse perspectives, the alumni said that Murray's views did not qualify as worthy of consideration. Beneath what they called the, quote, thin veneer of quantitative rhetoric and academic authority, Murray promotes, quote, the same thinking that motivates eugenics and genocidal white supremacist ideology. The invitation, in their words, quote, sends a message to every woman Every person of color, every first generation student, every poor and working class person, every disabled person, every queer person, that not only their acceptance to and present at Middlebury, but also their safety, their agency, their humanity, and even their very right to exist are all up for debate. The letter concludes by urging that those who dissent from the invitation to make that dissent known however you see fit. Whether or not because of the letter, by the night of the talk, 200 or so students shouted Murray down with chants of Black Lives Matter and, quote, your message is hatred, hatred, we will not tolerate it. 
Eventually, he and the moderator, Professor Allison Stanger, were escorted from the hall, and he gave his talk through a remote video feed. Cornell West, professor at Princeton University and activist on the left, helped organize a petition signed by numerous academics opposing the students' actions. The petition said in part, we should oppose efforts to silence those with whom we disagree, especially on college and university campuses. As John Stuart Mill taught, a recognition of the possibility that we may be in error is a good reason to listen to and honestly consider, and not merely to tolerate grudgingly, points of view that we do not share, and even perspectives that we find shocking or scandalous. What's more, as Mill noted, even if one happens to be right about this or that disputed matter, seriously and respectfully engaging people who disagree will deepen one's understanding of the truth and sharpen one's ability to defend it. West makes the classic argument for free speech, and one, by the way, with which I endorse in principle, but I and others, and others don't think it applies here. There are some positions that after long and serious consideration, resulting in a consensus that they are wholly without merit, are no longer open to serious debate. The argument for genetic inferiority is surely one of them. And there are many, besides me, who reject Professor West's suggestion that the issue of genetic inferior, inferiority remains open to debate. In his 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world, David Walker, a former slave, refused the terms by which Thomas Jefferson and others argued for black inferiority. In the debate over slavery, Walker chose armed rebellion over rational debate. As Professor Eddie Gloud, a colleague of Cornell West at Princeton explained, for Walker, rational deliberation about the inferiority of African people was on its face an absurdity. How could one argue rationally with someone who claimed that one lacked reason? <clears throat> Professor Gloud goes on to express his own views on the subject. Quote, some things are not debatable. When Charles Murray argues for black inferiority, what is there to debate? When Milo Yiannopoulos gets rich, claiming, quote, gay rights have made us dumber, and calling transgender people, quote, mentally ill, and rape culture a fantasy, are students supposed to listen politely? Speech that invalidates the humanity of others is not compatible with reasonable debate, Gloud says. He ends his point bluntly. How can I reasonably argue with someone who believes he is innately better. It's as intellectually valid as saying, kiss my ass. For Professor Gloud and for David Walker, there's no reason to engage with Murray because his argument is self-evidently incompatible with reasonable debate. I agree and I think there's an additional reason not to engage in, the, in that debate. As a letter from the Middlebury alumni put it, Murray's argument of genetic inferiority jeopardizes the well-being of every person in every group that is labeled inferior. People who are labeled inferior by, seemly, by seemingly credentialed speakers are in danger of seeing themselves as inferior. And worse, they are treated by others as inferior. That is what happens in societies that believe in genetic inferiority. We know only too well the consequences. Listen to what one former Middlebury student wrote to the New York Times. As a gay Latino, I find it troubling that students of color are continuously burdened to try to understand dissenting viewpoints that dehumanize us. When Charles Murray first visited Middlebury in April 2007, we did as Professor Stanger and others are suggesting now. We organized peacefully against Mr. Murray. Where did that get us? The word faggot was written on my door, and swastikas were drawn on a number of students' doors. And I blame Mr. Murray's invitation to speak and his, quote, research 
for emboldening, emboldening some students to commit these hateful acts. That description of the harm inflicted upon him by Murray's presence at Middlebury was echoed in the comments of eight other students who wrote this in the school newspaper. When you ask us to consider the other side of the argument, you are asking us to consider our assumed inferiority as a logical position. In this case, there's not really any other side, only de deceptive statistics masking bigotry. In the context of Middlebury, Dr. Murray's pseudo-scholarship is not merely pseudo-scholarship, it is intimidation. And what the students say is supported by this letter to the Times from Robert Weisbuck, a former president of Drew University and of the Woodrow National Fellow Fellowship Foundation. He says, African American children are exposed continually to the insidious cultural message that they are inferior in cognition to whites. When an advocate of eugenics-oriented bigotry appears on campus, is it any wonder that students of color and their friends would cry out, no more, we won't hear it. Rational debate is the lifeblood of a college campus, but it can become infected by a position that perverts reason. Charles Murray packages hate speech in a box of scholarly jargon. It's an old, old, mean-spirited ploy. We should all stand with those students who turned their backs on Mr. Murray to say never again. Weisbuck and the students and Professor Gloud make a compelling case for Murray's destructive impact. But free speech advocates make one further point I want to address. They worry that no matter how destructive Murray's views, not permitting him to speak will encourage the right to silence the expression of progressive ideas? The short answer is that no such encouragement is needed. Anyone with a passing knowledge of American history knows that those with power and privilege have always done whatever they can to silence progressive ideas, whether it was the jailing of labor organizers and anarchists in the 20s, the repression of the McCarthy era, the surveillance and attempted disruption of peace activists in the 60s, and the brutal assaults upon the Black Panthers in the 70s. None of those things happened because progressives had done anything to shut down the right. And so today, nobody would seriously argue that the suppression of advocacy of Palestinian rights has anything to do with comparable suppression of the right. Permit me a few final thoughts that attempt to tie up all these issues. First, when we talk about the right of free speech, we are talking about the First Amendment, what government can do, not private individuals. Second, speech often clashes with other values. We value fairness and justice and, e and equality. Speech sometimes has the effect of undermining those values. Sometimes that's its very intention. Third, there are many ways that colleges can have students avoid listening to people whose views they consider destructive of students' well-being. One, one way is not to invite them in, to the campus. Another way is to withdraw an invitation already given. A third is to shout them down and keep them from being heard. All three have the same effect. Fourth, it is important to remember that for the students, racist speech on campus is intertwined with all the other manifestations of racism that they are protesting taking over buildings, conducting sit-ins, going on hunger stri strikes, are all of a piece. When colleges take effective action to eradicate their legacies of white supremacy, those students' actions won't happen anymore. Finally, the charge is made that students are demanding protection from racist ideas because they do not wish to engage with ideas they do not like. To the contrary, I think the students across the country who are protesting racism on campuses and making demands for change are deeply engaged in one of the great moral issues of their time. And what happens on our campus affects all of us. I think we and the colleges owe them our respect and admi admiration. They surely have mine. Thank you very much.
thank you so much, um, Mr. Levine, for your clarity and eloquence in thinking through the classic arguments around free speech and your longtime defense of free speech and what it means when speech invalidates the humanity of some groups and particularly marginalized groups in our society. Um, I wanted to start with a question. Today we had about 200 people um, in the library lobby and we had people write their questions on cards, but given that this is kind of a small audience, um, we'll welcome questions from the audience. But I wanted to just start things off. Given your history of involvement in a range of civil rights struggles, can you, um, and building on some of the issues you raised about harm and the cause of harm, can you comment on the issue of weighing the risks um, when communities take a stand for justice and the various tactics of censorship and intimidation that are used to suppress the work? And if there is something colleges and universities can do to protect vulnerable communities that come under attack. What can, what can communities of activists do for themselves? Um, my wife, who's the best activist I know, says, first, be proud of who you are, and second, don't think you're better than anybody else. Um, and that's, I think, a good starting point. Um, in in, in uh, community action, unity, of course, is all and um, communities know best of all what their problems are. Uh, a skepticism about bringing in experts who know what the community's problems are is certainly appropriate. Um, beyond that, you know, the insights of, of um, uh, recent activists that all groups suffering oppression are united in, in uh, a single uh, voice and a single means of resistance to oppression, suffering the same consequences, that the root causes are common to all of them, um, is a cer certainly an important insight and it seems to me should affect all activism. Um, I've represented lots of activists. I've learned from them. I continue to learn from them. Um, I think they're, they're uh, activities are, have become increasingly sophisticated both on and off campuses. What colleges can do, I think, is, become, is to be much more tolerant of student activism than they are. Um, we are a punitive society, which is why we have so many people in jail, and colleges, I think, have internalized that ethic. Punishment seems to be the first recourse against somebody Students who violate rules, I think it ought to be a last recourse. And I think um, students then will learn to live another day, and I think the colleges and the students' lives will be better for it. I said private individuals and institutions can do what government cannot do. And you ask, well, what about when the government is doing it? And there, there, so then one's talking about the First Amendment and there is embedded in First Amendment doctrine uh, the notion of context. Context determines how First Amendment cases come out. It's why um, when, when uh, vigorous advocacy becomes a threat or an incitement, it becomes either protected by the First Amendment or not, and it is context, it is facts that determine what the outcome will be. Uh, I think colleges can do things for their students that can't be done by the government on the streets. That is, I think colleges can protect students from dehumanizing and degrading uh, speech that has the, an impact on students' lives that diminishes their ability or even negates their ability to uh, enjoy and learn from other uh, of their students and their professors. Um, we know, those of you um, who know the Skokie decision, know that the government can't protect you from hurt feelings. Colleges, and I'm not, I, I, it, it diminishes what students suffer from bigoted and dehumanizing speech to talk about hurt feelings. But what 
students suffer as a consequence of the dehumanizing speech that was referred to, even that packaged in a scholarly jargon like Murray's, is something that I think colleges have uh, an opportunity and a, a reasonable argument under the First Amendment to do something about. Having said that, there are lots of people who disagree with me. Um, there have been um, uh, codes of conduct at various colleges, many colleges, enacted to do essentially what Yale did, to protect its students uh, who they have failed, in the president's words, um, who are not able to function as they should be able to function. And so those speech codes or conduct codes have been enacted. And when they've been at public universities, they've been challenged by some students who wanted to engage in the kind of speech they think is protected by the First Amendment. And in almost all those students' if, uh, cases, if not in every one of those cases, the colleges have lost. So um, there are differing views on that. I am, uh, I'm not surprised that by the fact those codes have lost to challenges in court, partly because it's very hard to um, create a code that precisely defines what it prohibits. And when it prohibits in general terms like the law often does, it doesn't speak in context, it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, draw on facts. But when in a public university, for example, in Oklahoma, a group of students from a fraternity uh, were videotaped singing a drunken racist song, they were expelled. Nobody thought that that violated the First Amendment or if they did, no court found that they did. So. I think, and I don't think they could have been punished if they had done that on the streets, you know, unless they interfered with traffic or something like that. So I do think colleges can do different things uh, to regulate hate-inspired speech uh, than the, the uh, government at large can. I'm a little curious, uh, when you're talking about the Yale uh, email that went out, I think you said that was a request rather than sort of a demand. And am I correct about that? Were they simply uh, trying to encourage students to? Um... Yeah, it was not a demand. And a few days later, though, after Halloween, um, a large number of students paraded through the campus in the most degrading, vile costumes you can imagine uh, mocking those who said they need to be, quote, protected from that kind of dehumanizing speech. Um, so they did it. They didn't do it on Halloween, but they did it. But, uh, you know, the controversy erupted in, the, in, in this very angry and highly publicized confrontation with Krasakis' husband happened because of the email itself, notwithstanding that it wasn't a command. Ma'am. Oh. Why would that be considered hate speech when they did that with the worst possible provocative costumes? Why well, it would that it, be considered hate speech? Yes, it would be. But implicit in your question is the notion that hate speech can be punished. Uh, it can't. There's no such thing under the law as hate speech. What's a hate crime, then? Well, that's something else. When you commit a crime and the police prosecutors can prove that it was motivated by an intention to harm a person because of their membership in a particular religious, racial, or ethnic group, then it, there is what is called a hate enhancement punishment for that crime. But hate speech itself, vile, degrading speech that is uttered on the streets or in, at public universities or in public auditorium, they, that's not punishable. Charles Murray can speak in any public place. Milo Yiannopoulos can and does. Ann Coulter does. They all engage in what probably we'd all agree is hate speech, but it's not punishable. Um, so given how emboldened the white supremacists have become, um, particularly in the last year, 
Um, do you have any concern that denying um, certain proponents of their philosophy the opportunity to speak on a college campus could actually be you know, endangering students even more? Like, I mean, there was a threat at Evergreen, you know, shortly after the Weinstein incident, right? here. So, so it seems to me like the, the, the desire to protect students is not just about protecting them from you know, the harmful content, but then also the potential repercussions of... Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. I, I think people generally who advocate for controversial positions endanger themselves, especially in these days. So to stand out on the streets and loudly argue for the rights of Muslims can endanger you. Um, gays and people of color and transgender people will tell you all the time that if they make known their, their gender identity, uh, that they're subject to punishment, harm, attacks. So I don't think these actions that I'm talking about tonight, shutting down people's speech, endangers uh, progressives any more than simply taking any kind of progressive political action. I mean, as I, as I said, power in this country resides in the rich and powerful and the right, and to uh, advocate against those interests puts one in jeopardy. Mm. I don't, I don't think it matters what form or nature of the protest it is. It's just a marginal point of view in, in our society. How do we know it's helpful to prevent those conversations from happening, happening on campus when it's going to be encountered outside of the college? Mm -hmm. Anyways, it's not like these, like these FTAs are only being like burped up in college campuses. They exist outside of it. So I just, yeah, how do we know it's helpful? Well, as a starting point, I think it's helpful simply to not have to endure dehumanizing, bigoted speech in a place to which you've been invited and accepted and for which privilege you've paid upwards of fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 for some people. I think the college owes those students an obligation to make the place, at the minimum, inhabitable, um, and, and more so. Um, then you say, and many others have said the same thing, oh well, in the real world they're going to confront these same things. Well, that's true. Racism is pervasive. Hostility to uh, al alternate gender uh, identities is dangerous and pervasive. Um, I don't think being confronted by it in college prepares you for being confronted by it in the world at large. I think you'll learn soon enough what to do about it. I don't think you have to learn the ideas about it, and college is about ideas. And you can learn about racism and debating racism in ways other than having to listen to a racist. But I do think that uh, the experiences to which students will eventually be uh, exposed in the outer world are not made more tolerable by being exposed to them in the world in college. And I think if they don't want, if they ask for it, that's one thing. If they want to be dehumanized and degraded in college in order to learn how to deal with it in, in uh, the real world, the so-called real world, there are lots of opportunities for most of them in colleges which have a long legacy of white supremacy to endure degrading experiences. How do we know the people who don't want that are actually the majority of the people of their demographic? Um, you know, when people act as a matter of conscience, whether it's shutting down Milo or engaging in a sit-in, they don't necessarily have the authority of uh, a majority of their community, whatever that community may be, to do what they're doing. They do it because they think their behavior is morally justified. Um, 
I, I think when it comes to shutting down somebody who says the kind of things that Milo says, I think it's morally justified. Obviously, there are some who would disagree. say you're a free speech absolutist. Uh, the law doesn't recognize absolute free speech rights. I'm a strong believer in the First Amendment, as I said. I gather you are as well. Um, and the notion of a heckler's veto is a very important principle of First Amendment law. For those of you unfamiliar with it, it sort of relates to the kinds of issues that I talked about namely civil rights activists walking down the streets and um, people, in the, uh, people on the sidelines uh, causing a riot because they don't like the speech in which the civil rights activists are engaged. And in some places there have been attempts to arrest the civil rights workers for provoking a riot. And what the courts have fashioned in such situations is a repudiation of the notion of a heckler's veto. That, and, and heckler is, is a shorthand term for conduct that results in criminal activity provoked by people engaged in uh, peaceful protest. And the courts have said their right to peaceful protest cannot be defeated by those who so vigorously offend are, who are so vigorously offended by their speech. That's a heckler's veto, and the Supreme Court has rejected that. If you'll recall I said we're talking about what the government can do, and I'm not gonna talk about public universities right now. I'm talking what, about what private individuals can do. Private individuals engage in what you might be calling a heckler's veto. They say about Charles Murray, what Eddie Gloud says about Charles, uh, Charles Murray, I'm not going to debate my genetic inferiority. 
I'm not going to let people on my campus be imbued with the notion that they are inferior and, un and have them internalize that notion and have those around them internalize that notion and treat them as inferior people. That's a danger to my campus. I won't tolerate it. That's a veto of their speech. People who engage in sit-ins do things that violate the law. Uh, as Dr. King explained in his letter from, from the Birmingham jail, we have a, a moral obligation to put our bodies in the way of immoral laws. Um, the students in these cases are saying this is immoral speech. You can agree or disagree, but they think so, they think it's harmful, and in campuses in which students experience the kind of racism that Milo, and I say racism, bigotry, that Milo and Murray and Ann Coulter articulate, um, if they say no more, not on my campus, not with my $50,000, uh, I'm not going to allow it. Other students may say, but I paid my money and I want to hear them. Um, they can do that and they can say those things and there's no question that the students who are engaging in disruptive activity when Murray comes there or Milo comes there are depriving those students of the opportunity to hear them. Um, it's, uh, if they decide they want to do something about that, they can, but it is the same thing as a sit-in. Uh, a sit-in has the same vigorous opposition from those who, as a result, aren't able to get to, the, to their offices or get into the places where people are sitting in. Um, Brandon, I, I don't know if you really, if this audience is much interested in Brandenburg versus Ohio, um, but in, in 30 seconds, it's a case that, that allows um, advocacy of illegal activity. Um, and these, are, these cases emerged from the communist uh, purges or, or antagonism of the 50s and the McCarthy era. Uh, and their advocacy of the overthrow of the government was prohibited. And what emerged finally in Brandenburg is one could advocate illegal activity, such as the overthrow of the government, so long as it was uh, not an incitement, so long as there was an opportunity to debate the issue and, uh, short of uh, armed or militant action. That remains the law, I think, perfectly defensible view of First Amendment rights. Yes. Um, let's put the First Amendment aside for a second. It overlaps this issue for almost accidental reasons. On a college campus, the free exchange of ideas is part and parcel of the way progress is made. And so the fact that some colleges are public and some are private is more or less irrelevant. There has to be the ability to disagree. What you're advocating is a system because there's an asymmetry and it's easier to prevent people from speaking than it is to make a point. If I wanted, as a single individual, to prevent you from delivering this talk, I could just yell incoherently and no one could hear you. So how is it that in the system you're advocating that creationists won't prevent evolution from being discussed, that climate deniers won't prevent uh, environmental chemistry from being discussed? Who is it who gets to decide when it is legitimate to shut down a perspective? And isn't the only viable system simply to let all the people voice, even the president? That's, that's a young, an orthodox free speech position. The one that Cornell West essentially articulates in uh, what he writes. And I, I would be advocating this were there no First Amendment. It's not a, it's not a free speech perspective. In the Cornell West, West isn't is talking about the First Amendment perspective besides John Stuart Mill. What John Stuart Mill says underlies most First Amendment doctrine in this country. Um, so it's, it's a rational position, of course. But there are some things at some point that become non-debatable. They're too silly, too, too much of a, an intellectual hoax. Uh, it's uh, academic jargon, uh, boxed in uh, bigotry, um, and isn't worth debating. Um, but beyond that, it has consequences in real people's lives. 
And um, when, when a, an institution uh, suffers from uh, endemic racism or systemic racism, um, and you have students of color who are the victims of that racism and as a result are unable to fully enjoy uh, that which college supposedly offers them. Uh, I believe that in those circumstances, people have a, a right and maybe an obligation to say no more, never again. Can you do that as a white man? I don't think so. I don't think you have any credible claim that a speaker who comes there is doing to you what Milo does to transgender people, to gay people, uh, to women. Uh, so uh, that's what determines ultimately not the legality of what they do, uh, but the morality. So you're arguing for a system in which the color of one's skin dictates who does have rights. I don't, think, that, I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think that's the case at all. But having said that, we do have laws and policies in this country that recognize that people of a certain color have suffered in ways that you and I have not. You know that as well as I do. So that uh, that history has consequences for them. And not that it shadows them all the time, but it shadows whites. It dictates to whites the enjoyment of the privileges of white supremacy that people of color have never enjoyed. And as a result, white people not only enjoy privileges, but extract from people of color the consequences of those privileges that they suffer only because of their skin color. So it's not that they have privileges because of their skin color. One can hardly, with a straight face, say that people of color have privileges that white people don't. But it's to recognize that they have had a different So uh, you bring up examples of um, explicit dehumanization in his history, and we can explicit what dehumanization. You, you use that term as like the foundation of what we can decide is proper or improper. Is based on this idea of de dehumanization. Uh -huh. That's why I've heard you, you refrain. So um, in, in history, we have explicit examples of dehumanization that we can point to, and that society, through discussion and through exposure. Has, has said that this is improper. Um, but once we go from physical acts into verbal acts or symbolical acts, I just I see it as almost too complex to have a, a system of making explicit what dehumanizes somebody. And how do we enter into an understanding of what dehumanizes each other without the ability to have a conversation about that may be too deep and philosophical for me. <laughs> there aren't rules about morality. I mean, there, are, there are principles about morality. And um, uh, as I said about um, First Amendment cases, it's all very fact-based. That's why it's so difficult to come up with the uh, codes of conduct. And, you know, when King says we have a moral obligation to uh, violate immoral laws, there's no book we can turn to that talks about what an immoral law is. Um, but in most societies, there's some general agreement about morality or immor immorality, or maybe there's not. Maybe there's not. But um, when one acts as King did in a nonviolent way to obstruct the enforcement of immoral laws, uh, ultimately history is the judge of that. And I say in a nonviolent way, and you asked about what about Sanger's bad shoulder and Milo getting beaten up. I had nothing I said, I mean, you said I left that out, not deliberately. I mean, that had nothing to do with what they did. The point is they did shut Milo down and they did shut Murray down. That Sanger got hurt in the process. It was an unfortunate byproduct. 
really wasn't essential to my point, so that's why I didn't finish it. But nobody's defending uh, shutting down Milo or shutting down Murray by violence. I certainly do not. Anyhow, I'm not sure I fairly addressed what you spoke about. I'm not sure uh, I have more to say about it. There are a lot of awfully smart people here, and if any of you want to engage in that discussion, I'm happy to have you do that. I don't think I'm smarter than anybody else, but it seems to me that one thing that we haven't talked about much is the protected classes and the ones that are afforded, these are some of the protections that we talked about tonight. And the protected classes are based on data, historical history. It's not just a group of people. A bunch of folks who just come up and say, well, we were offended by this, so we want the government to shut this down, and if we talk to the right college president or whatever, they will be right and shut it down. We're talking about people, at least when the First Amendment is concerned. Well, in, in, the, in the cases we're talking about tonight, it's protected classes, and they're protected for a reason. Not a privilege, it's protection. Thank you. Um, do you want to take a question? Or? Are you looking to ask a question? Yes. I yes. want to oh, you're back. ask about the uh, BDS movement, because I know that you're defending uh, some of the campus organizations that are trying to uh, defend the uh, form organizations to support BDS. And you all know what BDS is? Yeah. Yeah. Not? And there are being... One second. It stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. It's a uh, peaceful, nonviolent movement organized by Palestinian civil society to boycott um, products coming from the occupied territories of Israel as a means of promoting Palestinian human rights and um, it's a uh, now worldwide movement. There are many students, colleges who uh, support that movement and the launching organizations that promote it. So they're being slammed by the universities, some of them, but also by the Congress, and that's the government. So uh, where do you see this going? Uh, it's it's unconstitutional, I'm, I'm quite sure. I mean, uh, it, the Congress and many state legislatures actually have enacted laws. The, the Congress has not yet enacted it, but many states have enacted laws that um, prohibit um, advocacy of BDS. They don't actually flat out prohibit it, saying if you uh, advocate for BDS, you'll be put in jail. Rather, they say that if you are a company that supports it by not doing business with companies in the occupied territories, you can't do business with the state. I think those laws, if challenged, would be unconstitutional. Um, and um, they've not been challenged because mostly they haven't been enforced. If you're in a situation where you come across an unjust law, um, what are some of the most effective ways to change that? I mean, there's there's uh, short term, you know, where you do a sit-in or a stand-in, which gathers attention. <coughs> that law is still in the books. Um, are you, you know, are you suggesting a case law situation? Or do you want to a what? case law where you enforce a court situation, or would you uh, go t towards the legislature or Directions are more well, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm big on court cases. Many activists say that court cases is where movements go to die, and so you know, I'm a believer in political movements, and I think that's how most change comes. Uh, court cases have validated some laws, like segregation laws, um, uh, laws restricting uh, the right to have an abortion. Um, but ultimately, I think lasting change comes about through community-based <coughs> organizing. And uh, lawyers can have a secondary role in all that. Um, sometimes legislatures can be helpful, but on the whole, they enact these bad laws in the first place. So you're saying maybe start more like through like an ordinance direction with local neighborhoods? Or? Well, I mean, there are so many varied tactics. New York's governor um, issued an executive order that sought to 
companies, companies doing business with the state um, who advocated support for the media. A, uh, a group of activists in Woodstock, New York, um, proposed a resolution to the Woodstock Town Council um, uh, declaring that it would be a free speech zone because boycotts are protected by the First Amendment. You have a right to advocate boycotts um, under the First Amendment. And Cuomo's executive order suggested that you could not. So Woodstock enacted its own local ordinance saying we are a free speech zone and we will resist enforcement of Cuomo's uh, executive order. Um, that seems to me pretty, uh, pretty uh, creative. And I think it's a terrific organizing tool because lots of people got involved in that, um, much more so than if a lawyer had a lawsuit. And so circumstances dictate the problem, wide possibilities of how to deal with that. Okay. I want to give another round of applause to Mr. Allen.